Chapter Eight of Night of Molokai by Eva K. Betts. The Hawaiian Islands were growing, growing in industry and in population. On the island of Maui, great sugar plantations flourished, and many laborers had been imported to work among the canes. Father Lenore had finished building a fine church at Waluku on Maui, and when time came for the dedication, Bishop Magritte decided to make the ceremony as solemn and colorful as possible. He knew that this would impress the natives, that it would please those who were already baptized members of the church, and interest those who were not. Elaborate arrangements were made for carrying out every detail of the ritual in all its splendor. Priests from nearby islands were summoned to swell the ranks of the ordained who would pay homage to God in the new church. Father Damien could leave his island with some peace of mind. The chapels he had planned were now built. He had well-trained catechists to share the task of instructing their fellow natives and preaching to them. His priest assistant knew the island and was known by his people. He answered the bishop's summons by boarding a small sailboat which would take him to Maui. It was a great joy to him to see once again the church's ceremonies beautifully carried out. He met and talked with priests recently come from Europe, who gave him his first news of the outside world. But that world became unreal and lost all interest for him when the bishop spoke to the assembled clergy after the dedication was over. He praised them for their tremendous accomplishments. There had been scores, hundreds, of baptisms. Chapels had been built in jungle and wilderness. Fallen away Catholics had been brought back to the fold. But there were still places gravely in need of missionaries. Molokai was one. Molokai, the leper colony. From the earliest days of human history, leprosy has been a disease hated and feared. In biblical times, people so afflicted were outcasts, compelled to live beyond the city walls and to utter the warning cry of, Unclean! if any one approached them. Even much later, in England, lepers were treated as if already dead, so far as civic or property rights were concerned. In Hawaii, where the disease had been introduced by European settlers and had made dreadful inroads, lepers were taken from their families and sent to the island of Molokai. But no further provision had been made for them. There were neither doctors nor nurses on the island. There was no hospital. There was not even shelter beyond what the silk themselves could arrange. The poor sufferers took care of themselves, and each other, as long as they could, and then they died. It was a grim and terrible place. Some missioners, both Catholic and Protestant, had gone to Molokai for brief intervals. But that was not enough. Even more desperate than the physical need was the spiritual need. A priest should be at hand always to minister to the sick and dying. The year before, Father Bertrand had been in Molokai, where he had built a little chapel dedicated to St. Philomena. Talk to the bishop, the natives had urged, while the building was in progress. Tell him it isn't enough for us to see a priest once a year. We've got a lot of time to die between visits. How are we to save our souls without a priest? That incident, and others like it, were in the bishop's mind as he moved about among the little groups of priests who were chatting together about their work and exchanging news from their homelands. He stopped to greet four of them who were standing together, Fathers Damien, Golston, Boniface, and Rupert. I am disturbed about Molokai, he told them after a few minutes' conversation. The numbers in the settlement are growing constantly. No one on the islands needs a priest more than these poor outcasts, yet I hesitate. Bishop, urged the four, speaking almost as one man, only say the word and any of us will go there. The bishop pondered the matter. Could you set up a rotating system? He asked at last. You could take turns replacing each other at stated intervals. The priests eagerly talked it over among themselves. It would be possible, they agreed, for each to leave his own district every year for three months, which would be spent on Molokai. In that way, none would be obliged to give up his assigned parish, yet the leper settlement would have constant attendance. Father Damien's heart was beating tumultuously. His eyes were shining with the light of a new ideal. This, he felt, was the work for which he had been ordained. On Molokai he would find the true purpose for which his physical and spiritual strength had been given him. It was decided. The rotation idea was accepted, and Damien was chosen as the first to go. It would be for a few weeks only, according to the plan. Yet, within himself, he felt some mysterious assurance that he would be permitted to stay there. Very shortly thereafter, the bishop and Damien boarded a vessel which was taking some lepers to Molokai. 
A ship leaving a Hawaiian port is usually sung away from the dock. The departing passengers wear necklaces of flowers called leis, which they cast on the water when the ship is a little way out from the shore. Legend says that anyone who throws these tributes to the sea will surely return again. Father Damien's ship pulled out to a very different accompaniment. Not songs, but sobs and anguished words from those departing and those left behind filled the air. When the flowers fluttered down from the deck, a great groan went up. For these poor souls, there would be no return. They could not hope to see their loved ones again in this world. To hope for that would be to hope that the others would be stricken with leprosy, too. The families could be reunited only in the colony at Molokai. There was little conversation between Bishop Magritte and Father Damien that night. Yet there was little sleep for either. They spent the long hours sitting on deck, each deep in his own thoughts. By dawn, they were near Molokai. The island was cut in two by a jagged mountain range, which was considered almost impassable. The little ship pulled in toward the end, occupied by Kalawao, the leper colony, and the fifty doomed passengers were put into boats to be rowed ashore. Are you sure? Father Damien, the bishop asked anxiously. More sure than I was before, answered the priest. His heart had been torn by the tears of the sick ones during the night, by the sight of their disfigurements, which would grow steadily worse as the disease progressed. He was consumed with the desire to get started on his work among them, to bring comfort to the living, consolation to the dying, to all a knowledge of God and his goodness. The bishop got into the boat, which was to bring him and Father Damien ashore, and sat, head bowed as the sailors pulled the heavy oars that drove the craft over the long rollers and onto the beach. He glanced at Father Damien and saw his eyes, filled with the light of compassion and love, fixed eagerly on the shore. The bishop felt humble. My children, said the bishop to the crowd of unfortunates who had gathered eagerly on the sands, you have had priests visit you before, but now I have brought one who will make his home here among you. He will indeed be a father to you. Be good and obedient children to him, and love him, for he loves you. Father Damien kissed the Episcopal ring and bowed his head as the bishop blessed him and blessed the people. Then the long boat pulled away, and he was left with his pain-wracked, disease-eaten flock. Father Damien walked around his new domain of Kalawaho, that part of Molokai partitioned off for the lepers by human laws and impregnable mountains. He had seen people with leprosy before, but none in an advanced stage of the disease. Here he met men and women, minus fingers and toes, feet and hands, lips and eyelids. These organs had literally rotted off their bodies. He could not, of course, control a human revulsion at such sights, but he could and did avoid showing it. From the first, he forced himself never to indicate by the slightest sign the sick disgust and horror inspired by the eaten bodies. Even stronger than his repugnance was his love and pity for the poor creatures treading their road to Calvary. He strode about in his white cassock, looking with dismay at the crude lean-tos which served as homes for the sick and suffering. Often he stopped and spoke to the children. Some, strangely enough, were healthy and normal. Many others were dwarfish and distorted from the disease. Coming at last to the chapel of St. Philomena, with his tiny cross above the door, he entered and knelt before the little altar. O oh God, grant me the strength and courage I will need, he prayed. Make me wise in directing these poor ones you have given me for my flock. And dear guardian angel, I will need you now more than ever. After a moment he got to his feet and looked around. In one corner was a broom made of twigs. He set to work sweeping out the dust and leaves and debris which had drifted into the little used building. Now there would be a priest here regularly. His heart lightened as the dirt flew. A shadow fell across the floor, and he looked up to see a man standing there timidly offering a gift of fruit. He held it in one hand, balancing it with the other arm, from which the hand was almost gone. Father Damien set his broom in the corner. Thank you, my friend. I was ready for lunch. Will you share the meal with me? For a moment the man stood motionless, then he muttered something unintelligible and backed away a few steps. Into his dull eyes tears had come. He waited until Father Damien took a piece of the fruit and ate it, then he quietly withdrew. The priest went back to his work to be interrupted a short time later by another sufferer, this time bearing a gift of flowers for the altar. Again Father Damien took the offering graciously, hiding his dismay at the cruelly ravaged face which tried to smile at him. Pitiful heart, have pity on him, 
he silently prayed. As the afternoon and the cleaning progressed, the number of visitors to the little chapel grew. More flowers were brought. Some of the people helped with the dusting and arranging. By the day's end, he had made many new friends. Also, he had greeted, with mixed emotion, of welcome and sadness, a few who had been his parishioners in Hamakua. The clean, decorated chapel pleased him. As he was about to leave the flower-filled altar, a man ran in to ask his help. One of the sick people had died, and his friends were about to lay his body in its last resting place. Would Father Damien officiate at the burial? Of course, my son. Father Damien stepped from the chapel. Will you lead me to the cemetery? When he arrived at the tragic spot, Damien could hardly conceal his dismay. The body, wrapped in rags, was being placed in a grave not more than a few inches deep. It was the best that the poor people could do, but it proved yet more forcibly to the priest the dreadful need which existed on the island, even in the most elementary matters. He thanked God again for the health and strength he would be able to throw into his task. To the list he had already begun in his mind, he added two more items, the digging of proper graves and the building of coffins. Suddenly, as happens in the tropics, the sun was gone. Father Damien's first day on Malachi was over. He had helped and comforted a few people. He had cleaned and refurbished the little chapel. He had done many things, but one thing he had not done. He had not thought of where he would spend the night. He wandered over to the great Pendanus tree, which grew near the chapel, and sat, leaning back against the massive trunk, smoking his pipe. His mind was filled with a kaleidoscope assortment of thoughts and pictures. The misery, hungry, and poverty added to illness that he had seen, flashbacks to the comfort, decency, and order of his boyhood home in Trimaloo, the vast amount of physical labor to be done in the settlement, the need of awakening the outside world to the inhuman way in which these poor sufferers were treated. He finished his pipe, knocked out the ash, and swung his body away from the tree. Stretching out on the ground, he looked up through the canopy of leaves at the soft stars above him. With a short prayer on his lips, he fell asleep under the tree that was to be his home for some time to come. As the days passed, Father Damien was more and more deeply disturbed over conditions around him. The people here had been removed from their homes, forcibly in many cases, and sent to the leper colony, and then, so it seemed, to the priest, largely forgotten. All they received were rations and a scant supply of cotton clothing. There had been some effort to provide quarters for the earlier comers but the numbers now far outstripped the accommodations. The few who had money were able to bring with them adequate clothing and small comforts, and sometimes to secure the shelter of a roof. The rest were dressed in dirty rags and slept on the ground in hovels made of grass or boughs. For a long time no one had cared what the spiritual or physical condition of the lepers was. Shortly before Father Damien's arrival, a new superintendent, Mr. Meyer, had been appointed. He did not live in the leper colony, but directed it as best he could from his home in the other part of the island. He was interested in the welfare of his charges and did all he was able to with what the government provided, which was very little. He was delighted with Father Damien's arrival, impressed with the warmth of his personality, deeply moved that this tall, strong, vigorous young man should, of his own choice, cast his lot with the lepers. He did not know, nor did the priest himself suspect, that the very presence of Father Damien would precipitate changes in the life on Malachi. The newspapers in the other section of the island found material for articles and a sacrifice they could not understand. They called him the hero of Malachi and turned the eyes of that part of the world upon the lepers and their needs. The Board of Health in Honolulu, which had until that time sent lepers to the island to live or die untended and almost forgotten, was not pleased to have the searchlight of public interest turned on Malachi. They resented the acclaim given Father Damien. But Damien's temperament was not one that depended on anybody's approval. He loved the sick and oppressed because he loved God. For his sake, he worked for them. And in Kalawao, there was much work waiting to be done. He must try to achieve a little cleanliness, a little order among his people. Handsome, laughing, tireless, Father Damien, little by little, instilled into his flock a certain sense of hope, a spark of ambition. Not hope that they would be cured, nor ambition to get away from the colony, but hope for a little love and attention from this strong friend who had come to live among them, ambition to earn his approval. Damien's first eight days on the island were filled with heavy manual labor as well as spiritual ministrations. He set to work digging graves and transformed the poor bodies from the shallow burial holes 
where the first wind exposed them, to deeper, more secure resting places. He built coffins to have them ready for the almost daily need. He cleaned out filthy huts and washed the long, untended bodies of the sick. The Board of Health heard of his labors. The publicizing of the necessity for them angered the men, and they came up with a plan they felt sure would force Father Damien to leave his charges. If you do not leave at once, you must stay there permanently. This was their threat. They were sure that no man would willingly accept that sentence to living death. Father Damien's eyes danced when he heard the ultimatum. He had been so afraid that his superiors would not leave him there, but now he had to stay. One of the first tasks which he set himself was the bringing of some sense of law and decent behavior into the settlement, a thing which government representatives had never been able to do. The lepers had been in the habit of distilling a powerful liquor from plants which grew wild in the colony, and drunkenness had brought all sorts of evils in his train. Damien knew he would have to persuade his children to give up the stills. Before the sun was up each morning, he had left his bed under the pandanus tree and was hard at work, and this labor continued until long after the sun had disappeared again. Besides being the colony's priest and grave digger and carpenter, he was its doctor too, for there was no medical man on the island. It was in his role as sanitation official that he was most severely handicapped, for water was scarce, and without water there could not be cleanliness. Malachi is an island which has been torn, plowed, and harrowed by volcanoes. The natives call it the land of the cliffs. Kalawao, on a promontory jutting from the northern coast, is cut off from the rest of the island by the Pali, craggy hills thrusting, in places, more than 3,000 feet into the air. Damien felt sure that those high places must offer good water supplies. If that water could be found and piped down to the leper settlement, it would be of tremendous help. As things were, the lepers had to carry water in cans and bottles from a stream some distance from the colony, a stream which sometimes ran very low. One day, accompanied by two men and several of his boys, he set out for a valley where he had heard there was a natural reservoir. Traveling was rough through the gulch, but after they had made their way well into the valley, they came upon a basin which nature had hewn at the foot of a cliff. Full seventy-five feet long, it was, they found by plumbing, twelve feet deep, just off the side where they stood, and eighteen feet not much farther out. With a prayer of deep thanksgiving in his heart, Damien turned back to the leper colony. He had found the water which would bring cleanliness and some measure of ease to a suffering flock. Getting the water from where it was to where it was needed might have seemed an insuperable problem to some people, but not to this rugged Belgian, who had spent his whole life meeting and overcoming obstacles. He presented his plan to Mr. Meyer, the colony superintendent, who wrote at once to the government in Honolulu, asking that pipes be sent. There was no answer. Damien asked that Mr. Meyer write again and include further requests for medical supplies, building material, and a doctor. Again, no answer. Then Father Damien inaugurated a regular bombardment of letters, and finally a load of water pipes was delivered to the island. No workmen came with them, but that was the least of the good priest's worries. He himself was big and strong and accustomed to work, and he felt sure that some of the less badly affected among the lepers could help him in the project. His first, simple, reasonable request met no success. The people were used to the unsanitary conditions and would not bestir themselves. Then he had recourse to oratory. He pleaded and argued and made speeches. The childlike Hawaiians were fascinated out of their torpor, and before long he had a band of volunteers marching to the shore where the pipes were being unloaded. The sailors handling the task were all sturdy men, accustomed to and able for heavy work. What a grand thing it would be, thought Damien, if strength like that were available for laying the pipe, too. Perhaps he would be able to interest them in helping. Father Damien talked with the captain, eagerly and excitedly describing the project, the need for it, and the good which would result. His enthusiasm was contagious, and probably before Captain Bull quite realized it, he had offered the help of his men in placing the pipe. The captain and the priest sketched out on the sand the way in which the new water system would operate. When the plan was clear in his mind, Father Damien rushed off to supervise the work, and to do much of it with his own strong hands. Before long, the clear, clean water from the mountain was pouring generously into the village. The dreary hopelessness left the eyes of many of the lepers as they began to realize the wonders worked by the faucets placed near their huts. 
but to Father Damien this achievement only pointed up the contrast between what was needed and what was available. The huts themselves, even with the new miracle of water, could never be cleaned from the accumulated filth of years, and try as he would, he could not interest the government in doing anything about it. One day he woke to see a lowering sky and scudding clouds. The sea was in turmoil, and, as he gazed, he was startled by the bullet-sharp crack of raindrops on leads of his pandano shelter. Almost at once the wind came roaring in from the sea. The flimsy structures called home by many of the lepers were snatched up, torn to bits, and scattered far and wide. Almost as quickly as it came, the storm passed. Father Damien hurried about, doing what he could for the sufferers, but while he regretted anything that made the lot of his children more difficult, he was not wholly sorry for the wind's work. The government in Honolulu had been deaf to his pleas for building materials, but now, with even the rude, squalid shelters gone, he was confident that he would be able to get some action. There was another factor in the case. More and more people, as he knew, were becoming aware through the newspapers of conditions on Molokai, and he felt that this must help his cause. He sat down and wrote a long letter to the Board of Health, describing conditions in the settlement and demanding aid. Just as he finished the epistle, a ship carrying some new patients dropped anchor. Damien hurriedly got into a canoe and paddled out to give his letter to the captain for delivery in Honolulu. Ahoy, father! He looked up and saw that the ship was the Warwick, the same one which had brought the pipes. The captain and crew, since helping with the water supply project, had taken an active interest in the whole colony. Now came the question, And how is our water system working? Fine, captain, just fine. Will you come aboard, father? Yes, if I may. I have a letter I want you to deliver. Father Damien clambered aboard. He was greeted with interest and affection by the seamen, and escorted up to the poop deck, where the captain stood. The priest held out his leather. As you see, captain, he said, the storm has cleared the colony of most of its shelter. I must have some solid buildings, which will not disappear every time a high wind blows. The letter is a request for supplies. Will you see that it gets into the proper hands? The captain thought for a moment. Why not come with us and deliver it yourself? He smiled. Then you can add the force of spoken persuasion to the arguments you have written. The words brought the whole unjust situation sharply to the priest's mind. But there should be no need of persuasion, was his stormy reply. These are sick and suffering human beings. Children of God, the same as you and I. Just look. That is the point, Father. Look. Your people are out on this island. Nobody sees them. The government are a group of men who would prefer, if possible, to forget their very existence. Come with me and be the public conscience. While the two talked, the boy who had ridden out in the priest's canoe had been lazily stroking the water to keep the small craft close to the Warwick's side. He looked up as Father Damien hailed him. Take the canoe back to shore. I am going with Captain Bull. You're not leaving us, Father. There was consternation in the boy's voice. For a few days only, Damien replied. I have business in Honolulu. I want building material and more food for my people. I will be back very soon. During the short trip to Hawaii, Father Damien marshaled the facts he wanted to present. He realized that he must make a good case, but he found it impossible to understand how anyone could know of these mortally sick people, underfed, needing clothing, without shelter, and not feel it a privilege to do something for them. The sail to Honolulu was a pleasant interval for the priest. Fresh air came gratefully to his lungs, accustomed to the stench of corrupted bodies in unclean huts. Eris, habituated to the moans of the suffering and the dying, rejoiced in the sound of wave and wind. But though his senses relaxed, his ever-active mind was at work. Almost as soon as the Warwick touched the dock, he was off and away to see the bishop. It was to him that the first report must be made. Bishop Magritte listened with sympathetic interest. He understood Damien's problems and promised wholeheartedly to do all he could in the line of spiritual and material aid. And, what was especially encouraging, he promised to do it at once. Then Father Damien hurried off to the offices of the health board. This organization was composed largely of people of white stock who had been born in the islands. They held office under the native king. Some opposed Damien because of difference in religion. Others resented any sort of interference from an outsider. Now they made him feel it. The officials were displeased at the popular acclaim which had been given to the hero of Molokai. They were unhappy, too, at the exposure of conditions prevailing in the leper colony. 
from office boy to receptionist and secretary, they all did what they could to keep the priest from having the interview he wanted. They had thought they were dealing with an ordinary man who would be impressed and confused by this demonstration of official red tape. They learned how wrong they were. Here was a dedicated man, one accustomed to meeting obstacles and overcoming them. He had come to see the president of the Board of Health, and he proposed to see him. He did see him, but his reception was angry and discourteous. But my people need, they must have, better food and clothing. Why, some of them are wearing the tattered remains of garments they had on when first they arrived on Malachi years ago. They need better houses. They need... The president broke in. Sir, you are interfering in matters which do not concern you. You are a priest who has decided that the Catholics in the leper colony need your spiritual ministrations. Suppose you confine your activities to that field. Smug, well-clothed, well-fed, the man twitched in his chair and picked up papers on his desk. As far as he was concerned, the interview was over. Father Damien did not see it that way. The temper which he had fought so hard to control flared up. He became quite explicit about his feelings concerning the Board of Health, its members severally and collectively, and their method of operation. The man across the desk grew purple with rage. You seem to forget, Father Damien, he broke in at last, that there is a law which states that anyone from the leper settlement is forbidden to leave its boundaries. I am not a leper, replied the priest. True, but you live in the settlement, and your coming here is an infraction of the law. I suppose you are going back to Molokai, the official went on, and I warn you that if you ever appear here again, or so much as cross the mountains to visit any other colony on the island, I'll have you jailed. Father Damien looked at him, a slow, considering stare which completely evaluated his opponent. Then he spoke. There are times when it is imperative that I see my bishop, he said firmly. I will see him. There are Catholics on the island, not of the leper colony. I will visit them. The president of the Board of Health arose, shaking with fury, and left the room without replying. The bishop was prompt in sending the materials he had promised. On the same boat with his contributions, the Board of Health was represented by a letter. It simply repeated the threats of arrest if Damien again left the leper colony to go anywhere for any reason. A pronouncement was also made that in the future, no one but lepers destined for the colony could land on it. Father Damien seemed really cut off from the world. The trip to Honolulu, while it had resulted in these new prohibitions, had produced better things, too. Besides the contributions from the bishop and his flock, public interest had been reawakened. Public pressure was applied to the government, and a shipload of lumber was the first result. End of chapter 8 Recording by Maria Therese